who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. We're singing hymn number 107, Praise Ye the Father. 107 from the Red Hymnal, Praise Ye the Father.
come in two parts again. First section, we'll look at the Old Covenant, beginning with the prophet Malachi, the third chapter. This uh, time of year in our lectionary calendar is the presentation of the Lord. That's a reminder of the event when Jesus as a baby was presented in the temple. And we'll consider a reading from that text uh, in a little bit. But you might bear that in mind as we think of the Lord's presentation of himself in the temple. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. And then from the Psalms, we'll look at Psalm 84, verses 1 through 12, a reflection on the beauty and wonder of God's heavenly temple, his dwelling place seen through the refraction of God's earthly temple. Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praises. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs, the early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Finish our reading here from God's Word. Let's bring our request to the Word in prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your mercies to us. We thank you for your faithfulness in providing for our earthly needs. We thank you for this place where we may gather to worship you according to your Word. We pray, Lord, that your blessing would be on us as we uh, hear your Word proclaimed. We pray that you would uh, encourage us and lift us up as we reflect on your protective care. We thank you for the glory of your temple, your heavenly courts. We thank you that we have the joy of entering into the very presence of God through Christ's blood and by the aid of your spirit. We pray, O Lord, that you would receive us and grant us your blessings. We pray for our growth in faith, hope, and love. And we pray that you would be glorified in that. We pray, Lord, that you would bless those who are unable to be with us this morning. We pray for Linda and Dale as they have uh, problems with their digestion and upset stomachs. We pray, Lord, that your hand of healing will be on each
each one very especially that as Dale uh, sees a specialist on Wednesday that that would go well and that she would be spared of surgery but that some healing would be able to take place in her life. We pray for John and pray that you would give him relief from these headaches. We pray that you have mercy on him, be gracious to him and sustain him. We thank you for his faithfulness and his hard work and we pray Lord that you would watch over him. We pray for Amos Blakely. We thank you for her, for her trust in you and her desire to be with your church. We pray that as she's not feeling well, that you would watch over her, restore her health and strength, preserve her from harm, and we pray for your provision for her. Father, we thank you for the work of the Presbytery. We pray that you would bless the efforts of the church to advance your kingdom. We thank you for the establishment of a new work in Downingtown, and we pray for the pastor, Greg O'Brien, and those who are with him, that your uh, blessing will be on that new congregation. We pray for our new effort in, in northern Pennsylvania. We thank you for David Holmland and his travels up there and the uh, believers that are gathering there. We pray that your blessing will be on that and that a, a church of the Lord Jesus will be established there as well. Father, we pray that you would be with our missionaries. We thank you. Father, we thank you for others who serve around the world. We pray for your blessing on their ministries as well. We thank you for your goodness to us. We pray that as we uh, observe the Lord's Supper this morning, that you would bless our hearts. May our communion with you be blessed and joyful, and may our faith be quickened. We pray that you would teach us to pray as well, even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
are reading the 22nd verse. I read for you through the end of the chapter of John, chapter 10, beginning with verse 22. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are gods. If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said, I am the Son of God. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign. But everything that John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. Let's pray. We thank you, O Lord, for your word. We thank you for the encouragements, the guidance, the help that it provides us as we make our way through this uh, world today. We pray that your spirit would bless the opening of your word to our hearts, give us ears to hear and hearts to understand. We pray in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. It was winter in Jerusalem, and as Jesus walked about the temple uh, vicinity, uh, he took shelter in Solomon's colony. It was a bit of an open area, but it was had a roof to it, and it would block the rain and some of the winds, and then and so, uh, as he walked about uh, the temple area, that's where he was found. In fact, um, it, it seems that it is called Solomon's Colonnade, or Portico, because it was connected to the original temple that Solomon had built. It was the only thing that remained of that original temple. You recall that Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came in and swept through the city and destroyed the temple, knocking it down until it was a rubble. But yet, apparently, there remained bits and pieces of it, this being one part of that. Jesus is in winter in Jerusalem. The winds might have been swirling about him, at, just as the controversy about him and who he was was swirling about him. People wanted to know, who really are you? 
Jesus, you, you recall, was, if you will, somewhat coy in the way that he would respond to things. He didn't say outright to them, I am the Christ. I am the King of kings and Lord of lords. I am the one whom God has sent to save all mankind. Uh, he, he, he was a little bit coy and did not say it in so many words. And so the Jews were quite frustrated with this. And so John notes that they uh, gathered around him, and it's almost as though like the wind swirling about, they swirled around Jesus. And it was almost a menacing, threatening way in which they came around him and they, they said to him, why are you holding us in suspense? In other words, why are you holding us up in midair? In such a way that we don't know where to fall. We don't know whether we, we should accept you as the Christ or whether you're just uh, a, a good teacher, a rabbi, or just what it is you want us to believe. So they're, they're confused. In fact, I think you can just perhaps speculate a little bit, but uh, judge their motivations here. And it seems that they are hostile in their uh, questioning of Jesus. They really did not want to know if he's the Christ so that they could follow him. They wanted to know that if he's going to make that claim, and then they can take certain actions with regard to him. And so they ask him, are you the Christ? Tell us plainly, stop beating around the bush. Say it. And so they're waiting for a response from Jesus. Jesus uh, gets back to them and says that, well, I've been telling you this already. You've just not been listening. The works that I've been doing, these are what show that I am indeed the Christ. And so Jesus points to his works as evidence, as the imprimatur from God, indicating that he is the one who is sent by God to be the Savior. The problem for Jesus was that he could not answer the Jews' questions on their face value. Because the Jews had a different idea of what the Christ was as to what Jesus understood the Christ to be. They were looking for a military leader, they were looking for somebody to throw off the Roman Empire, to set Jerusalem and Judea free. They were looking for a military conqueror. And so if Jesus says to them, yes, I am the Christ, then that fits in with all these misconceptions that they had about the Christ. And so he just couldn't say to them plainly, I'm the Christ, because they had all these false notions. Jesus came to bring a spiritual kingdom. Recall later, as we'll see, he stands before Pontius Pilate, and Pilate asks him if he's a king. He says, I am. But his kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would be fighting for my release. Jesus came to bring a spiritual kingdom. And so, Jesus points them to his works. It reminds me of what Jesus said to the disciples of John the Baptist, to recall, when they came to Jesus and they asked him, are you the Christ or should we be looking for somebody else? Even John the Baptist wants to know. And how did Jesus respond? Did he just simply say, well, yes, I am the Christ. I'm the one. No, he pointed to his works and said, take a look and see what, what you're observing here. The blind receive their sight, the lame are walking, um, the deaf hear. Blessed is the man who does not take offense at me. And so Jesus points his works out to people and says, Believe the things that I am doing here, and so you will understand. Not to put this on too mundane a level, but it seems to me that Jesus here is, in some respects, speaking to people in symbolic language. You need to pay attention to what he's doing as well as what he's saying. His works are revelatory just as his word is revelatory. There was an authenticity to Jesus in that his works supported his word and his word explains his works. They were of a piece. I think of 
my relationship with my dogs. An odd place to go here, but I can talk to my dogs, and, and uh, dogs have a certain vocabulary that they understand. They understand about 165 words. Some dogs are very smart and might understand about 250 words. Uh, some of the smarter breed, dog breeds are um, the, the uh, German Shepherd, the Poodle, and the Border Collie. Some who are less intelligent are, might include the, the uh, Bulldog and uh, a few others like that. The Afghan, I understand, is also a very, very um, dull animal. Anyway, when I talk to my dogs, Duke is very intelligent and he can understand a lot of what I say. But sometimes I speak to him in symbolic form. I might do this for him. Now what does that mean? Well, I say it to him, you and me, always together. It's a sign that I give to him to indicate that just as I pick him up as a puppy from that cage in the pet store to the very end of life, I need to put him down. I'll be with him. You and me, always together. And so there are ways in which we communicate with each other. It may be in verbal ways, but also in nonverbal ways. And Jesus, in the way that he spoke with uh, the people there, his works were a vivid testimony to who he was. He was the Christ, but his kingdom was not material. It's not raising an army. He's not developing political connections. He's not uh, forming relationships with other nation states. He had a spiritual kingdom, and he was calling for repentance and faith. I, I get concerned with some of my brothers who speak about King Jesus and have a a strong emphasis on the kingship of Jesus. And I understand scriptures say that he is the king of God's kingdom. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. He is the one whom God has set on his holy hill at Mount Zion as king, Psalm 2 says. But one thing you might notice is that throughout the New Testament, throughout the scriptures, Jesus is never specifically identified in those terms, King Jesus. Is the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus? He is king, but the scriptures are concerned that we don't confuse God's spiritual kingdom with a merely political effort. Yes, God's kingdom has an impact on politics, an impact on economics, an impact on all of life. And the kingdom of God transforms families, churches, nation states, and we should work towards that end. But always bear in mind the central purpose is repentance and faith in Christ, the forgiveness of sins and everlasting life. And so Jesus is the Christ, but he does not follow the conceptions that people have in general today or in his day in particular. He came to be the Messiah and Savior of men. And so he, he says to these men, why is it that you don't believe these things? Why is it that you do not understand the kinds of things I've been saying? I've been saying to you, we're together. I, am, I and the Father are one. But you have not been listening. You do not believe. The works that I have shown, you've rejected. Why is that the case? Well, here he's very direct. It's because you are not my sheep. I contrast my sheep, hear my voice. You are not my sheep. Jesus is one who knows who his sheep are. And he has a mission to go into the world to save his flock. To call his flock out of the world and to bring them home. And he knows both who his sheep are and who are not his sheep. Now, do we not see here the discriminating love of Christ? Now, he's focused uniquely upon God's elect. 
There are those who are my sheep and those who are not my sheep. And Jesus, according to his sovereign nature, according to the plan of God, understands who those two groups are. And so out of the, the uh, nation of Israel, Jesus is gathering together a people for himself, a new flock, rooted in Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, and the rest, but expanding beyond even the borders of Israel. And the Jews felt threatened by this. They tried to intimidate Christ and his flock. They excommunicated the blind man for professing that Jesus was the Savior. They threatened that anyone who professed that Jesus was the Christ would be thrown out of the synagogue. And so they hoped to separate the people of Israel from the Christ, from Jesus. Now Jesus says, first of all, you are not my sheep. It's a very stern thing. Then he says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life. Note his ownership of his flock. He is the one who calls them by name. He is the one who gathers his flock to himself. It's not that we are all out there in a morally neutral position and we can hear the presentation of the gospel and make our own decision one way or the other. It's up to us in the end. Jesus says, my sheep. He has a particular people that he has for himself. And he says, these are the ones that I give eternal life to. See his sovereign work. I am the one that give them. They hear my voice. So it is his voice, his gospel call, that effectual call that comes to the hearts of many and calls them out of this world to gather into his flock. Jesus is the sovereign Lord who is gathering his flock from the nations of the earth. They are his sheep and they belong to his flock. There is a discriminating love in the purpose of God. And Jesus is engaged in a sovereign way and bring them to himself. Note the blessings that he brings to them. First, I give to them eternal life. Here is the wonder of God's saving work that whereas once we were dead in trespasses and sins, once we were totally given over to the spirit of this age, we were subject to the, the, the philosophies and the religious beliefs and so forth that were occupying all of mankind, but then God comes and sovereignly produces new life within us such that we become a new creature. We are raised from the dead. God himself produces a new heart within us. And he gives us eternal life at that moment of faith. You have eternal life. This is a sovereign, powerful work of God but it's one that has great comfort and assurance for the people of God, such that throughout this life, we can know that he who began a good work in me will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. This is something that God has done in me, and therefore it's not something that I can lose on my own, or no one else can take it from me. In our modern day today, there are many who would suggest that you can lose your salvation. And I agree. You can lose your salvation. The thing is, it's not yours to lose. Christ is the one who holds you, who keeps you. He is the one who's produced a new heart and a new life within you. And that's not something that can be changed. Just as I bear the uh, uh, inheritance the family inheritance of my parents. You can cut me and you'll find that I'm connected to George and Ella McLaren. That is something that I cannot deny. That is who I am. By the same token, God has changed you and made you new. And that cannot be changed. You will forever be the child of God. You cannot lose that salvation. Because it's not yours to lose. 
is God's great work in you. And so Jesus goes on to say, not only has he produced a new life within you, he is also one who will hold you in his hands, and no one, he says, can snatch you out of my hands. Here are the Jews arrayed against Jesus, they're surrounding him. They are ready to stone him, as we'll see in a moment. They are boiling with rage underneath. I mean, you talk about a cold wind blowing. There was a real frost in what they had to say in their relationship to Jesus. And John is something of an artist in the way that he composes this. And just as Nicodemus saw Jesus at night, so it's winter time in Jerusalem. There's hostility towards Jesus and his flock. But Jesus says, my sheep are in my hand. And no one plucked them out of my hands. And then he makes that assertion doubly strong by saying, my father, who is greater than all, the one who created the heavens and the earth, who sustains all things by his word, who governs men and nations, my father also holds them in his hand. No one will ever be able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. We are doubly secure in our relationship with God because God the Father and God the Son hold us together. And the hand of Jesus would be the hand that bears the scar wounds of the cross on it. A hand that had within it the emblem of love and grace and mercy. The emblem of satisfaction for sin. It's this nail-pierced hand that holds you along with the mighty hand of God the Father. The believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is secured not by his good works, not by his religious performance, not by his daily devotions and all these kinds of things. He's secured by God Almighty. Why would you not trust in this Savior? Run to him. Follow after him. Hear his voice when he speaks. Listen to him and yield your life over to him. And Jesus said, My sheep, hear my voice. They hear, they listen, they understand, and they follow him. That's what God expects of us. The Jews were not listening, they were not hearing, they were seeing, but they were not understanding. They rejected everything. He was not fitting in with their conceptions, and so they rejected him. They were not listening. My sheep, Jesus says, listen to me. We should listen to him. There's a most profound thing that Jesus says here at the end of verse 30. I and the Father are one. And so just as powerful as it has been for him to say that I hold my sheep in my hand and no one will snatch them out of my hand, it's a personal determination of he's a mere human that's admirable, that's very committed, and we can appreciate that. But if he, on the other hand, says that I and the Father are one, he's saying that I am God. Here we hear, hear an echo of John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Jesus affirms His divine nature. And there is no misunderstanding of that part of what Jesus had to say. As the Jews took up stones ready to stone Him. They understood what He's saying. And they're going to go after Him. But Jesus affirms his divine nature. Notice here two things about this. He says, I and the Father are one. So there is they are one not really in purpose, not really one in intention. I think the Jews there would say, yes, we are one with the Father. Yes, we want to do the will of God. We are one with God in that sense. And if Jesus was saying that I'm one with God, I, I seek to live my life in alignment with God's purposes and His will, then they would not have had cause to be upset with Him. 
But this oneness that Jesus was speaking of was oneness of essence. It was a metaphysical union. I am fully God, is what he was saying. But at the same time, he's saying there's a plurality in this divine nature. I and the Father. And so what you have there are two personalities within the Godhead, at least. The Father and the Son, equally and fully one God. So you have here an intimation of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Plurality and unity within the Godhead. Well, as I said, the Jews picked up stones. It might be that they had them already in their hands or their pockets or whatever, but they picked up some stones, ready to stone them, and then Jesus begins to question them for that. Why are you trying to stone me? Well, it's because of blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. You know, isn't that the original temptation of Satan to Adam and Eve? You shall be as gods. And many today fall into that with the, the, the kind of pantheism, the eastern pantheism that is sweeping across our country today. The sense that I have a spark of the divine within me and I am God and someone to get within and find their inner divinity. Well, this is not what Jesus was about and not what the Jews were about. They recognized that there was a creator-creature distinction. God and man are separate and different, qualitatively different beings. And there's no connection in that sense. We always remain creatures of God. And so the Jews' problem is that Jesus was making himself, being merely a man in their view, making himself out to be God. Well, he was in fact God, the Son of God. And then he argues for it in a way which uh, takes uh, note from their own writings from the Psalms. And he describes this as the law of God, Psalm 82. And here the argument is a, an argument from the lesser to the greater. And he's taking away their argument uh, in, in, in saying that Jesus makes himself a God and therefore that's a problem. Jesus points out at Psalm 82, verse 6, where the psalmist speaks of the judges of Israel whom God has established. And he says that you are gods. In other words, the judges of Israel functioned in the place of God when they made their judicial decisions. And their decisions, as they reflected the will of God, were God's decisions. You know, in, in some respects, the, the preaching of the Word of God is the Word of God. As a pastor opens the Word of God to you and explains that Word faithfully and truly, that Word is the Word of God. God speaking to you. And when Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, we're not just understanding a, a set of theology, a, a, a group of theological propositions, we're in a relationship with Jesus Christ. We hear his voice as he speaks to us through his word. So Jesus takes them to the word of God. And incidentally, as kind of an aside note, Jesus says, and the scriptures cannot be broken. He affirms that no word of God falls short. It is perfect and true through and through. We can rely upon that word as it was given to us. But the, ju the judges of Israel were described as gods. And so why would they complain that Jesus called himself God? Now, in fact, Jesus was saying, if it applied to you, and you're willing to accept that, nobody objected to that, why would you object to the one whom God has sent into the world, one who truly is fully God? Why would you object to him saying that he is the Son of God? And so he undermines their argument by an appeal to Scripture and showing, that, showing their own inner hypocrisy at attacking Jesus. The text concludes... They wanted to arrest him, and Jesus once more escapes their grasp. And the text concludes, and they kind of 
strikes me as almost a melancholic note, almost a note of nostalgia, where Jesus finishes his time here in Jerusalem for the time being. Now, mind you, this is A.D. 29. We saw him at uh, the Feast of Tabernacles in October of the year. The Feast of Dedication is in December of the year, winter. It was a dedication of the temple after it was polluted by Antiochus at Epiphanes in 165 BC, I believe it was the year that Judas Maccabeus rededicated the temple. And so uh, that, that's a bit of the, the, the circumstances here. So we are very close to Christ's crucifixion. The Passover is coming later on. But Jesus here leaves Jerusalem in winter time and goes across the Jordan River to the place where John was baptized, to the place where he likely was baptized, where the father said to him, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. He goes back to that place and the sheep come to him. They hear his voice. They gather around him and they believe on him. His work continues. There are moments in life when we face winter and there's hostility in family, in church, community, to us, our profession of faith. We're at times ostracized, criticized, uh, not wanted, disassociated. You should know that Christ walked in Jerusalem in the winter months. And when people swirled about him, hostile to him, he gave a faithful testimony to who he was. And we should be mindful that this one stands for us in the world. Jesus walked in the winter of life. Amidst, if you will, Jerusalem's discontent, Jesus was faithful and true. And so we can take comfort in that. Take comfort as well that your heart, your soul, is secure in Christ. He will hold you and keep you safe through all the troubles of life. As I watch the news and see reports of Christians in China being persecuted, I saw a picture of one man. He had two soldiers with him. One had his hair back like that. The other one had his hand pinned down and they were putting wooden sticks under his fingernails. He was a member of the Shangdu early reign reformed church there. Another man was sitting down with a bar across his legs. They were going to break his legs. And he wondered, would I remain true to the Lord under those circumstances? Would I be able to maintain faith in Christ? Jesus says, my sheep, my sheep. No one will pluck them out of my hands. It doesn't mean you won't suffer. It doesn't mean you won't go through hard times. But you remain the sheep of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will keep you for eternity. He gives you eternal life. And you will never, ever perish. Never. That's his promise to you. Father, we pray that your spirit would bless your word to our hearts and comfort us in the midst of a wicked and evil world. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ and be comforted by his hand of protection over us. We pray in Jesus' name.
Let's stand and sing praise to God for all his blessings to us. Let's stand and sing praise.
returned into Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. We'll finish our reading from God's word. Let's take a moment to confess our sins together. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus who has come into this world to uh, enter into your very presence. He alone is worthy to enter into your temple. He alone is the rightful heir of the temple and all that belongs to that temple. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would include us in Christ, view us in Jesus. And we pray that you would forgive us for our many sins. Forgive us for our sins against you and against each other. And help us, O oh Lord, to walk more faithfully and more obediently before you in the world today. We ask for your blessing on us in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord assures us of forgiveness in these words from Isaiah the prophet. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. The emblem of God's forgiveness is given to us in the Lord's Supper, this communion meal whereby we have fellowship with our living Lord. He has forgiven us of our sins, and he grants us grace that we might walk before him. I'd encourage you to approach the table in faith, trusting in God's provision of salvation for you. If you're not a member of Christ's church, not a believer in Christ, not walking with him, then you should not take part in the communion meal at this time. Let's pray for the Lord's blessing on the elements. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the communion meal that you've given to us, this reminder of the uh, breaking of our Savior's body. We pray that you would bless the bread and cup to our hearts, that we would be nourished on grace. We pray that your spirit would encourage us and equip us to follow after you and to respond to your love by loving you in return. We pray in Jesus' name. Jesus, what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to us, and said, excuse me, and said, this is my body, which is for you, do this in remembrance of me.
after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
as shepherds of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. 